our community looks like it's in poverty, our van office looks like a barn. This is Manistiquin Lake Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. Confidential if you could keep anything confidential. We come here and there's nobody here. The band office is empty, according to the sign, due to COVID. What you see here, this is what we see every day. There's no housing. I don't want to go back there because the roads are so poor. Questions around accountability and frustrations often echoed in many other First Nations communities. We were born here in this land. So there's no place we can move. But where does the root of the problem lie? We've made the Indian chief like the Indian agent and consolidated power once again, rather than seeing that uh, that power has to be diffused. People have lost hope in our community. People say, why do I have to vote? Why do I have to? Nothing's changed. It's the same. The Minnesdequin Lake Cree Nation is a small reserve 340 kilometers northwest of Saskatoon, home to just under 1,000 band members. Elder Matilda Lewis gives APTN a tour. In one of the buildings, there's a strong odor of mildew. Even in the cold of winter. It's really disappointing, it's really frustrating. APTN was introduced to Lewis by Lisa Crookedneck, who stays in close contact with people back home. The strongest thing in that community was family. It was so family oriented. There was unity. People visited back then. People didn't fight. We had games. We had picnics. We, like family get-togethers. Like the whole community would participate. Today, there's nothing. The first teachings, obedience, respect, humility. Lisa Crookedneck works in Fort McMurray, Alberta, but has fond memories of growing up in Minnesdequin. When they're 10 years old, and now... It breaks my heart to think about back home right now. She says today, the community struggles with issues from gangs to addictions to lack of housing. And she claims what's missing is leadership. These are my relatives that are in leadership. These are the people that have the authority to make the decision, to make the change in the community. But I haven't seen that to date. I haven't seen the change. So I thought, well, I need to start speaking up. I have nothing to lose. The laws are the immutable laws, like the sun comes up, the waters flow, the grass grows. Those are the immutable laws, so you can't go against those laws. So that's primarily where, if you're talking about good government, you're talking about what is the best way to keep all those things going. Rachel Snow argues the key to accountability is revitalizing original laws. She is Yarhe Nagoda Ketchin, a member of the Wesley Band. She has a law degree, and while she isn't a practicing lawyer, she is an Indigenous law consultant. So there's a distinction between what you would term or what you define as government, the way mainstream thinks about government, versus governance or how we governed ourselves. Those are two different things, and I think that's why there's 
some difficulty now when we talk about self-government uh, because that we're looking at putting our worldview and everything, our way of existing, into a box. Growing up, Snow saw the impact of the Indian Act on traditional governance firsthand. So my late father um, in Tibja Mani, uh, which means walking seal, was uh, also known as uh, Reverend Dr. Chief John Snow. He was the son of a hereditary chief. In 1968, the elders asked him to speak for them at a meeting with Indian Affairs. And Indian Affairs told him at that time, uh, you can't, you know, stick to your preaching. We only speak to elected officials. The elders' solution? To hold an Indian Act election and ask her father to run. He was chief for 24 years. Snow says it's an example of how the Indian Act diminishes hereditary governance. That's one of the things I think that Indian Affairs was successful in is developing this um, Indian Affairs chief and council governance system and that our people have become so colonized now that we really feel this is our governance system when it's really not um, something that we developed but that was something that was forced on us. At the University of Victoria Law School, John Burroughs is the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Law. And we've made the Indian chief like the Indian agent. You know, just passing along the Indian agent function from the agent to the chief is, is contrary to good governance. It's contrary to self-determination and it's certainly contrary to many of our traditions. Burroughs, who's a Anishinaabe, says the Indian Act does not allow for checks and balances. The Indian Act sends accountability in the wrong direction. It sends it to the Indian agent and to Ottawa rather than sending it back to our people and back to our societies and back to um, the practices of our people. And seeking accountability in some communities isn't easy. If you don't agree or if you're pushing back against First Nations chief and councils, then you can get into trouble. Yes, you can get sued for defamation. It happened to Rachel Snow. And my band is Wesley, but it was the Chiniki band that uh, sued me for defamation. I was writing about some of the concerns we had as people in the community that we weren't getting the information. Earlier this month, Stony Nakota residents voted no in a referendum that would commercialize nearly 3,000 hectares of land. For activist Rachel Snow, it was a victory, but she received this days later a claim stating she is being sued for $1 million for what Snow calls voicing her opinions. I laughed when I, when I received it. I didn't think it was uh, serious. The defamation lawsuit has been ongoing since 2018. APDN reached Brian Evans, CEO of Chiniki First Nation, by phone. He said he could not comment as the matter is still before the courts. Snow says band members anywhere can face backlash for speaking up and she claims the big problem is many band members across Canada don't see a clear mechanism for accountability so they're angry and they're upset they're frustrated they go to Indian Affairs they go to the they go to the council uh, nothing is done uh-huh. I have yeah. elders phoning me. I have friends phoning me. I've been fired. What do I do now? And I always say, you know, don't lose hope. You just do what you need to do to keep going. Lisa Crooked Neck says the community of Minnesota is suffering. You go to the school. It looks like it's been it's been abandoned. The arena has been shut down. It hasn't been renovated. It's very old. It's not safe. There was a protest in September 2020. Local media was there. Remains of the protest were still visible when APTN visited in March 2021. 
There's just basically no no justice for, for the community. You have reached Minnesticwin Lake Cree Mason. Coming up after the break, getting answers in Minnesticwin. For Chief Leslie Cookitnick. And is self-government the solution for First Nations accountability? Sovereignty and self-government are not the same thing. I think one of the things is that we have to build more confidence and reliability in ourselves to address and solve the problems that we have versus outsiders trying to solve our problems. Every time I go back to my community, it saddens me. All you see is gangs, drugs, alcohol. It's broken every family. Like, I feel like, wow, where, where did the families, where did the traditions go? Where did, where did Minnesticwin go? Lisa Crookedneck is from the Minnesticwin Lake Cree Nation. On a tour of the community, we noticed rough roads. We could see boarded up windows and doors. This is what we've been seeing for the last 18 years. Minnesticwin Lake Cree Nation uses the Indian Act election rules, which means chief and council serve two year terms. Rachel Snow says, that presents a challenge for First Nations governments. Voting every two years, you could have a whole new council in, in a two-year process, so that doesn't lend itself to continuity or stability. And Indigenous Services Canada is the only place to appeal these elections. There's no independent body or office to investigate complaints. It's part of Indian Affairs' uh, master plan to either assimilate or terminate First Nation people, so they really don't care that there is uh, no solution. People can turn to the courts, but it's expensive. And one bad ruling sets a precedent that can actually make things worse. You can do what you and do. Snow says what a court decides for one First Nation may not work for another. Canada doesn't understand this. Canada loves its cookie cutter law. We're brown in Alberta, they're brown in BC, so all the laws pretty well apply. Retired Justice Ian Binney served as the Supreme Court of Canada Justice from 1998 to 2011. He says courts aren't always the best way to settle a dispute. The courts are not the only place where justice can be done. And in fact, the way the system operates now, it works a procedural injustice against uh, people who don't have that kind of money. Justice Binney worked for the Justice Department before getting called to the bench. And I was uh, chair uh, of a committee dealing with the uh, Section 35 rights. So that's where I had quite a long, uh, prolonged uh, exposure to uh, uh, the politics of the Indigenous rights uh, issues. Your Majesty, Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, Fellow Canadians, mes chers compatriotes. In 1982, Aboriginal rights were enshrined in Section 35 of the Constitution, and the courts were called upon to define those rights. So the courts took it up with some enthusiasm, as you say, but on the other hand, it gave a, uh, the politicians uh, an excuse not to do anything. And the solutions are very one-off. So I sometimes think if the politicians had really uh, had, put, had, had their feet put to the fire, more progress would have been made than is possible in the courts. Many Canadians think Section 35 rights are about hunting, fishing and land. And those rights are big items on the negotiation table. And what's touched upon the Aboriginal rights of Indian people. The, uh, Indian but back in the 1980s, the Constitution started to change the conversation. According to the Constitution of 
additional agreement that we made a couple of years ago, granted one more constitutional meeting. Indigenous peoples also have a right to self-determination, and in 1983, a parliamentary committee led by Keith Penner agreed. An all-party committee recognized and confirmed what has been a fact for hundreds of years, a full and inherent right to govern their own affairs. This is a kind of a bombshell that blows apart uh, existing discussions. So clearly there's no single formula for self-government. The report recommended creation of legislation to advance self-government and the eventual end of Indian affairs. It certainly took over the agenda once it started to go. So I would think from 1984 onwards, it was the big item, but not so much before. John Paul is the director of the Atlantic Policy Congress. The APC does policy research and advocacy for Maritime First Nations. We're not trying to create self-government for the government. Paul has worked for years in government-to-government -government relations and self-determination. He says self-governance has to be by and for Indigenous people. I think one of the things is that we have to build more confidence and reliability in ourselves to address and solve the problems that we have versus outsiders trying to solve our problems. Paul says self-determination has to include accountability. Even when we make the transition from what we have as an Indian Act today to self-government, those principles of governance, accountability, and transparency are still going to have to be there. There are a lot of First Nations getting it right. The stereotype of the million-dollar chief is not the norm. APTN did a story in 2015 on chief salaries. Welcome to Coquitlam First Nation. My name is Ron Giesbrecht. Last year, in the wake of the First Nations Financial Transparency Act, many headlines in the media focused on the million-dollar chief in B.C., but the average salary is much more modest at about $60,000 a year for a complicated job. John Paul had commissioned a study that looks at what a chief's job is worth. One of the most interesting facts that we did find from the study was that most of the communities, when they looked at the salary of chief, was not above the standard. It was either at the standard or below the standard. But when accountability goes bad, there are not a lot of options for the grassroots. We demanded answers, but to no avail. The no answers were ever given out. There's just nothing. The list of concerns is long, from governance and transparency concerns to financial accountability. Lisa Crookedneck has waited decades for a house. I've been told every two years, you'll get a house. And I, it's been over 40 years, I haven't seen the house yet. And homes on reserve are in serious disrepair. People living three to four families in one home. There's one elder, in fact, the other day, that told me that one of your elders, your close relations, is living in a little trailer all winter. And I said, really? Like, honestly? APTN was invited to Wilfred Stick's home to see his living conditions for ourselves. Stick had a fire in his home. The smell of smoke and charcoal still lingered. Ironically, Stick believes the fire started in the smoke detector. But have you have you heard anything from the band? Nothing at all. Nothing. No, I don't bother them. Yeah. We didn't see the chief or any counselors while we were in the community. This mailbox is currently full and cannot receive new messages. We emailed and called, but never got a response. Honestly, I really want to see 
the leadership and the elders and the adults and the youth to come together because I haven't seen that. We can find ways to disagree agreeably. Anishinaabe law professor John Burroughs says coming together doesn't necessarily mean everyone agrees. And then we can find a process to be able to work through that agreement and disagreement. And, uh, you know, it could be lawyers that guide that conversation. It could be other people that have some respect and authority within the community. Of course, it's something we've done traditionally for as long as we've been alive as Indigenous peoples. So do you think it'll ever get fixed? Huh? Do you think it'll ever get fixed? This out here? Yeah, I don't think so. Not all complaints and accusations aimed at council are legitimate. The trick is sorting out local politics from the real issues. And there are plenty of real issues because of the many flaws in the Indian Act system. And I think for the Indigenous people, for First Nations here in North America, they really understood that well, that there was a give and take, that there was an interconnectedness and interrelatedness between everything, between the cosmos, between the plants, the animals, and everything. Next week, we look at a First Nation getting it right. Member two shares its secrets to success for free. Our repayment is that that community moves up. And we meet Rob Louie, who's fighting for accountability. I rolled up my sleeves and I began working on the Articles of Incorporation for a national organization dedicated to helping band members get access to justice. The Indian Act uh, really does um, strike at the heart of our traditional ways of sharing power and looking out for one another. It gathers power into too few a uh, number of hands. Mm -hmm.